pleased to wait in here, Sergeant. I'll tell Mr. Talky Horn that you're here. Hello, George. Hello. You're here before me, are you? Pretty close, are you? With the great man? We've done a bit of business, George. We're pretty familiar. Yeah, look out. Here he comes. Sergeant George, thank you for coming. I believe Mr. Smallweed has told you that I'm interested in a certain Captain Horton. The captain's dead, sir. And possibly. Then again, possibly not. Now, you served under Captain Horton at one time and were his attendant in illness and were rather in his confidence. Is that so? Yes, sir. That is so. So you may have in your possession letters, accounts, instructions in Captain Horton's writing. If I had, sir, what is that to you? I wish to purchase them. And may I ask why, sir? No, you may not. And if you were a man of business, you would know better than to ask such a question. But if you're afraid of doing injury to Captain Horton, you may set your mind at rest about that. Aye. He is dead. And so you say. Now, assuming that you have letters in the captain's handwriting, what will you take for them? I'd rather have nothing to do with it, sir, if you'll excuse me. Oh. If I did have letters, they would be private and personal, sir. Between him and me and not to be bought and sold. Admirable sentiments. Sergeant George, is it true that you gave shelter to the man Gridley? It is, sir, and I don't regret it. A threatening, murderous, dangerous fellow? I don't care for your associates, Sergeant George. And I don't much care for yours, sir, if it comes to that. Sergeant George is in debt, is he not, Mr. Smallweed? He is indeed. Right up to his throat he is. And the debt could be called in at any moment. Quick as lightning if my friend in the city gave the nod, Mr. Tulkinghorn. And then Sergeant George and any dependent on him would be ruined. I'm afraid so. Very much afraid so. Would you care to reconsider, Sergeant George? Change your mind? There would be no shame in it. No, sir. I would not. And some carriage. Built to go far and fast, I'd say. Who the devil is it? I wasn't aware we were expecting visitors. If you please, Sir Lester. Yes? I believe it's Mr. Rouncewell's carriage. Ah, yes, of course. Mrs. Rouncewell's son. <laughs> what would one call him? A self-made man, I suppose. Treats himself pretty well, I must say. Mm, no doubt he can afford to. One understands he owns a number of factories. Mm. Extraordinary. Mr. Tulkinghorn informs me he has been invited to go into Parliament. <laughs> My housekeeper's son invited to go into Parliament. She had another son, I understand, who turned out very badly, if that is of any comfort to you. Ran away to the wars and so forth. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But this one, the Iron Master, has written to me and asked for an interview with the two of us. But I'm confounded if I know what the fellow could possibly want from us. Mr. Rouncewell, my lady. Sir Lester, Lady Dedlock, it is very good of you to see me. We would always wish to oblige Mrs. Rouncewell's son, sir. Please sit down. Thank you. I will be very brief. Lady Dedlock has been so kind as to take the young woman we have just seen into her service. Rosa Cartwright. Exactly. My son has fallen in love with Miss Cartwright and asked my consent to his proposing marriage to her. I am not at present inclined to oppose their engagement if the young woman is willing to engage herself. But I would have to make it a condition of my consent that she did not remain at Chesney Wold. Not remain at Chesney Wold? I don't understand you, sir. Mr. Rouncewell, pray explain what you mean. Willingly, 
Lady Deadlock. My wife and I were plainly brought up, but we have risen in the world, and we have been able to educate our son and his sisters well, very well. Now, unequal marriages are not so rare in our world. The son of a factory owner may fall in love with a young woman who works in that factory. Mr. Ransfell, do you draw a parallel between Chesney World and a factory? I agree. The places are different, but I think the parallel may be justly drawn. Are you aware, sir, that this young woman, whom my lady, my lady, has placed near her person, was educated here, was brought up at the village school, just outside the very gates of this house? I'm brought up very well, I'm sure, as far as that goes. Mr. Ramswell, My lady, I'm... permit me one moment. Mr. Ramswell, our views on duty and our views on station and our views on education, in short, all our views, are so diametrically opposed that to prolong this discussion would be repellent to your feelings and would certainly be repellent to mine. This young woman is honoured with my lady's notice and favour, but if she wishes to withdraw herself, she is at liberty to do so. We are obliged to you for the plainness with which you have spoken. Now let us leave the subject. Sir Lester, Lady Dudlock, I thank you for your attention. I shall very strongly recommend my son to conquer his present inclinations. Good day. He's an obstinate fellow, that Sergeant George. Obstinate? He's a veritable brimstone beast. I'd like to tear his head off. I'd like to smash him to pieces. You try to do the man a favour, he spits in your eye. His position is vulnerable. I'll call in his debts. I'll lay possession on his shooting gallery. I'll have him in the debtor's prison. Not yet, I think. Watch and wait, Mr. Smallweed. That's what I've learned at law, and it's served me well. Mr. George may yet see reason. Let him reflect a while. He owes me money! I'd like to squeeze it out of him like blood out of an orange. And I would. If I had the strength. He has the strength. And the passion, I believe. Is he a man of violence, Smallweed? Man of violence? It's his profession, Mr. Tolkienhorn. He's a past master in it. Then let's not put it to the test. Not yet. I believe I've been put in a hard spot, Phil. Those two, they could break me between them. Not them. Ain't no one could break you, Governor. They could put me on the street, and they're hard enough to do it. And if I was on the street, so would you be, Phil. Been on the street before, Governor? You don't want to go back there. I don't want to put you back there. If I were just to do what they say. But it's a matter of honour, Phil. This old place. It's all we know, ain't it? And it's all we've got in the world. It's about that, Governor. I won't see you on the street, Phil. I made you a promise a long time ago, and I'll never go back on it. They put me in a hard place. A very hard place. I'll let you out one day, I will. <laughs> Who's that? It's me, Mr. Crook. Clappy, at your service. Kenji Cowboys! <laughs> the very same. You can put that away, Mr. Crook. What do you think I've got here? The two and six penny. <laughs> You're half pickled already, aren't you? <laughs> well, let's make a proper job of it. Take it drop self. And not on this occasion, Mr. Crook. A bit rich for my blood. Barbary. That's what you are after. Here. Miss Barbary. Mr. Crook. I don't believe it. Miss Barbary was the lady who brought up Miss Esther Summerson. Ah! Not that one. That one, Lady Deadlock, now. 
must be another one. Well, they must be related. Mr. Crook, you see what I'm saying here? Miss Esther Summerson, my angel, Mr. Crook, may be related to Lady Deadlock herself, however distant. And thus, I have a claim in John Dice and John Dice. There's two and six, buddy. First class. You should try it, young man from Ken's Cowboys. Never hear the name of Horden, Mr. Crook. Horden? Oh, I have. What's he got to do with? It's just, I heard the other day, Miss Esther Summers. Yard Angel. <laughs> was previously known as Esther Horden. Horden? Here, I can show you a thing. <laughs> Here. These belong to my lodger Nemo. Captain Arden. He really was. Ah! Hey, don't touch. What thing? Hey, worth. Hello? I keep them all. I keep them all. Arden, yeah, but smell. Smells of ladies. Love letters. You would not want to leave me so soon, would you? Even for a lover. Oh, no, my lady. Good. Now, I have been thinking of spending some time in our London house. Should you like to come with us? Oh, yes, my lady. Then you shall. Miss Esther Summerson. Esther Horden. Nemo, the law writer. Known as Captain Horden. First, Miss Barbary. Second, Miss Barbara. Lady Deadlock. likes his fellow officers very much, he says, that there is a good deal of gaming in which he does not join. <laughs> perhaps I'm alive for the making of it. If you please, sir, Mrs. Woodcourt. Mrs. Woodcourt. Oh, perhaps you'll have some news. Mr. Jarndyce, you must think that this is very strange, but I will tell you how it is. My son, Alan, particularly wished to be remembered to you all. Of course, Mr. Woodcourt, the physician. And as I was visiting in the neighbourhood, I thought I might as well come and introduce myself, you see? An excellent thought, Mrs. Woodcourt. Delighted to make your acquaintance. These young ladies, I suppose, are Miss Ada Clare and Miss Esther Summerson. Which is which, may I ask? This is Miss Clare and this is Miss Summerson. Miss Clare. Miss Summerson. Yes. I see. Well, there he 
nice. <sighs> Miss Summerson, I don't suppose you will have heard of Morgan Ap Kerrig? No, Mrs. Woodcourt. I'm sorry, but, but I haven't. A very great hero of our country. He's mentioned in the Mabinogion. And we are descended in the direct line. My son Alan, wherever he goes, he will always remember his pedigree. There's a lot of young ladies all over the world who would dearly love to catch a husband who was descended from the line of Morgan Ap Kerrig. Catch him with money, you know. But he won't be caught. Not with money, or beauty, or anything else. Because birth must always be the first consideration. Is he well, Mrs Woodcourt? And in good spirits? Very well, thank you. Seasickness has never troubled the seed of Morgan Ab Kerrig. Might I ask, Miss Summerson, what your family was? I never knew my mother or my father, Mrs. Woodcourt. No? Well, I dare say there's a good deal of that goes on in England. Everywhere. I'm going back to the country. We'll set off tomorrow morning first thing. A bit of country air, Joe. That'll see you right. The boy's harmless enough, in my view, Mr. Tuggenall. In himself, perhaps. But he knows things that he should not know. There is a danger that he might talk to people. The reputation of a great family is at stake here, Inspector. Can't arrest him for knowing too much, Mr. Targinal. Well, of course not. But you could keep an eye on him, perhaps, as a favor to me. Make sure he keeps with his own kind, out of harm's way. That's all I mean. Well, I think that could be arranged, Mr. Targinal. I am obliged to you, Mr. Bucket. Let's go in. Let's go in. Give here. Private and confidential. Ain't we the swell? Ow! Where's he, Guffy? Never you mind. Out of it. Yeah, shut. Take me. Come on, Joe. <laughs> Don't mind him, ma'am. He'll soon come back to his head. Don't let him come near. She won't hurt you, Joe. Let's get you in a chair. Come on. You're mixed up because you've got fever. I think we should take him home with us where he can be cared for, Charlie. 
Will you come with us, Joe? You're not the other lady. No. I see now. She's very light, but not so young. Tradesman round the back. Uh, Mr. Guppy of Kenge and Carl Boys to see Lady Deadlock on a matter of private business. Step inside, sir. My dear Lady Deadlock. Lady Deadlock. My lady. Oh! Mr. Guppy. Of Kenjin Carboys, uh, my lady. But acting in this instance <clears throat> on his own initiative. Will you sit down, Mr. Guppy? Oh, uh, thank you, my lady. If you'll excuse me. Find it more natural to be on my legs on such an occasion. All right, Mr. Guppy. Say what you have to say, if you please. With your ladyship's permission, then. <clears throat> uh, I'm not aware whether your ladyship ever happened to hear of or to see a young lady by the name of Miss Esther Summerson. I saw a young lady of that name not long ago. Miss Esther Summerson is my angel. I have vowed to do everything in my power to advance her interest. Now, there is a mystery about her birth. If I could make any connection with your ladyship's family, then she might have a right to be a party in Jarndyce and Jarndyce. And if I could establish that, she might look upon my proposals with more favour than she has exactly done as yet. I see. Go on. Uh, I have um, met the former servant of the lady who brought up Miss Esther Summerson. Her mistress was a Miss Barbary. And... Uh, Miss Barbary being your maiden name, I imagine there might be some connection with your ladyship's family. Possibly. Yes. Very good. Uh, now, this Miss Barbary was very close, but on one occasion she seems to have confided in my client. And on this occasion she volunteered that the little girl's real name was not Esther Summerson, but Esther Horden. Oh, God. Uh, your ladyship is acquainted with the name of Horden? I have heard it. Uh, and now I come to the last point in the case, as far as I have got it up. There was a law writer known as Nemo who died not long ago in the house of a man named Crook. Now, I have discovered very lately that this law writer's real name was Horden. It was supposed, your ladyship, that he left nothing behind him which to identify him. But he did. He left behind him a bundle of letters tied up with a ribbon. Who has them? The man called Crook, your ladyship. But I'm pretty sure I could get hold of them and bring them to your ladyship in strict confidence, if your ladyship wishes me to. Your ladyship is not very encouraging, on my honour. You may bring them, if you please. 
Stick up here. Say no more, milady. It shall be done. I wish your ladyship good day. Case, what do you say, Harold? You had better turn him out. Turn him out? I'd be cross with me if I deserve it, but I have a constitutional objection to this kind of thing, you know. I always did when I was a medical man. <coughs> but he's, uh, he's not safe, you know. There's a very bad sort of fever about him. What is he to do, then? Well, upon my life, I... I have not the least idea. I am but a child, you know. Yes, I believe there's no such another child on earth as yourself. Uh, there's a bed in the loft room by the stable. You can sleep there tonight, and tomorrow we can arrange for him to be taken into a fever hospital. Very unwise. You can't recommend anything for the boy, I suppose? My dear John Dice, I observed a bottle of cooling medicine in his pocket. It's impossible for him to do better than to take it. And you can tell him to sprinkle a little vinegar about the place where he sleeps, to keep it moderately cool and him moderately warm. But it is my considered opinion that you are very unwise in giving him house room at all. Thank you. All right, then, Joe. Let's see what we can do for you. All right. Thank you, miss. You're very good to me. I'm sorry I thought you were the other lady. Never mind, Joe. We sleep now. That's tomorrow. Thank you, Charlie. You get to bed yourself now, miss. You've got nicely settled. Safely stowed, Mr. Tulkinghorn. You're quite sure? Oh, yes, sir. Acting on information received from a friend of ours, it was all done very quiet and discreet, Mr. Tulkinghorn. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I was being over-cautious, but the interest of one of our oldest English families are involved here. Will you take a glass of wine, Mr. Bucket? Thank you, Mr. Tulkinghorn. I will. Morning, miss. 
It's a nice bright day. Mr. John Dyes! Mr. John Dyes is missing! Stop! I have to tell you that Miss Sampson is gravely ill. The doctor has told me that she exists. that she exhibits all the symptoms of the smallpox. Miss Summers' mate, Charlie, has been kind enough and brave enough to volunteer herself as Miss Summers' nurse. No one else, no, no one else, Ada, is to enter her room or to handle any dish or cup or anything else that she has touched. Is that quite clear to you all? Yes, Mrs. Jones. I pray to God that you may survive this. I blame myself, of course I do. I, I should have had the boy taken into a hospital immediately. Damage might still have been done. But I think Esther would have done the same, even if she didn't know what the consequences would be. You must reproach yourself. I pray to God she may survive this. But the juice of it is, if she does live, which is unlikely, she will be so horridly disfigured that any person of a sensitive disposition, such as myself, will find her too distressing a sight to bear. She will still be Esther, Mr. Skimpole. And her true friends will love her just as much as they ever did. And for dinner, my lady. Whatever you think fit. I got very good four quarter of lamb from Diggins's, my lady. So Lester's partial to lamb. Lamb, then. Very good, my lady. Oh, if you please, my lady. Yes, Mrs. Rounds. You remember the young ladies that were staying with Mr. Boythorn a while back? What of them? One of them's taken very ill with a smallpox. Like to die, poor girl. Mr. Diggins had it from Mr. Boythorn's groom. Which young lady? Oh, not the John Dice Ward, my lady, the other one. Miss Summerson. <laughs> Janus! <laughs> Kenji Carbuncle! She's his angel. First Miss Barbary, second Miss Barbary, Captain, Captain Orden, all in here, all in here somewhere. In my belly. Never felt so, so full of joy. Hey, Lady Jane. <laughs> oh, oh. One was toast now. Hey. I'm still damp. So much did that do. What's it on? Uh, on the dress, dearest James. You know when the lady. It's a love letter. I can read it. What's this, Lady Jane? I can read. I can read. I can read. Light. 
This is late to be abroad for you. I found it very close tonight, Mr. Snagsby. Queer sort of flavour in the air. Open the window, still there. My poor birds quaking, twittering. I think the cook at the Sol's Arms must have burnt the chops for Michael's flight. And I don't think, not to put too fine a point upon it, but they were quite fresh when they were shown the gridiron. I dare say that's it, Mr. Snagsby. Very painting sort of weather. It's coming down, sort of soot. Very greasy to the touch. Oh. What's that? Who goes there? Just only me, Mr. Snagsby. Copy of Kenjin Carboys on urgent business waiting upon Mr. Crook. It's very quiet and dark in there, Mr. Guppy. I think you shut up shop very early tonight. You'll see me, Mr. Snagsby. A matter of pressing importance. Very much to his advantage to attend to sight. Crook! You there? Come on, me old friend. Business. Business. There's money to be made for both of us. Crook! Where are you, you old devil? What's going on? It's all this silly muck. Crook! It's Guppy of Kenjin Carboys. Come for the letters. Charlie's worn to rags sitting up with her night after night. Oh, she's glad to do it. She's a good girl, the best yes. of girls. If anyone could pull Esther through this, she will. Richard asks constantly about Esther in his letters. He's so anxious about her. Yeah. Yes, I know how much he cares for her. <clears throat> and what else does Richard have to say for himself? He has a good deal to say. Well, I don't think you'd care to hear it. Oh, come, Ada. I, I, I would be angry with you. Nor him for that. Not now, not at this time. I've been coming to think I was too hard with a pair of you. His love for you is as steady and true as anything I ever saw. And mine for him. But what he says does worry me. And I think it will worry you too. Then you had better tell me. He wants to devote more of his energies to his suit in the Chancery Court. I feared as much. And he wishes to break off with Kenshin Carboys and engage another lawyer to defend his particular interests. Please don't be angry with him or with me for telling you this. You later. Nor will I be angry with him. He's not to blame. This accursed lawsuit warped him out of himself as he's done with others before him. He must do what he thinks right. I bear him no ill will for it. Make sure he knows that, Ada. And, and th th there will always be a place for him here at Bleak House when he wants it, and a place in my heart, too. Move along now, please. Nothing to see here. Crook won't be opening up today. But I need to recover some property for a client officer. Guppy. Kenjin Carboys. Don't care who you are, sir. No one goes in there and nothing comes out, not till after the inquest. Yes, I know all about the inquest. I am one of the principal witnesses. Better get over there, then. Corrin has gone up already. Come to order, gentlemen. <clears throat> now we are assembled here to inquire into the extraordinary death of Mr. Crook, landlord and proprietor of Crook's Rag and Bottle Warehouse. The second suspicious death in recent months reported at the same premises, the first being of the law writer, popularly known as Nemo, 
recorded as an accidental death brought on as a result of the excessive consumption of opium. Mr. Snagsby. My lord, I had occasion to venture abroad outside Mr. Crook's business premises, and I remarked upon the greasy odors on the air. Remarked to who? Yourself? To, to me, Your Honor. I had been complaining about the very same. And you are? Miss Flight, tenant to the late departed and claimant in the courts of Chancery. Mr. Snagsby and I remarked upon it, and it was then that the young man appeared upon the scene. What young man? That young man there, that fine, handsome young man, Mr. Guppy of Kenge and Carboys. Ah, yes, Mr. Guppy, who, as I understand, discovered the remains. Is that so, Mr. Guppy? I had that unfortunate honour, Your Honour. <laughs> Silence in court. And what, may we ask, was Guppy of Kenjin Carboys doing in Crook's rag and bottle shop after hours? Up to no good, Mr. Guppy. Your Honour, I take grave exception to that insinuation. Mr. Snagsby and Miss Flight will confirm that I was a regular visitor at Mr. Crook's establishment, a trusted friend. It was my pleasure to perform small services for the deceased, to read him letters and documents that he was unable to himself decipher. And on this occasion? The same, Your Honour. Mm. And to collect a bundle of letters which he was keeping in safe holding for a third party for whom I was acting in a private and confidential capacity. And you found him... Dead, Your Honour. <clears throat> Burnt. A small part of him still alight with blue flame playing round about. Like a Christmas pudding in a pool of brandy. Exactly so, Your Honour. Except I believe in this case it was in fact gin. All right, Mr Guppy, you may stand down. Gentlemen of the jury, the deceased was an habitual consumer of vast amounts of spirituous liquor, which, as we know, is highly flammable. The condition of the body, we've heard, was such that all the evidence points to it having been consumed by fire, but not from the outside inwards, as is most usual, but from the inside outwards. In short, I believe this is an example of that rarest of phenomena, a case of spontaneous combustion. Get way there! Get way there! Oh, dear. Oh, Lord, how my bones. Be silent, sir. Are you aware that you're disturbing a properly convened coroner's court? That's what I'm here about. My prophecy. My prophecy. Crook stuff. Put a guard on it. No one to touch it. Least of all that preening young villain from Kens and Carboys. Your property, Mr. Smallweed? That man Crook was Mrs. Smallweed's brother. She was his only living relative. We shall make good our title. Mr. Tolkienhorn is my solicitor, and it's a brave man who tries to cross Mr. Tolkienhorn. So, transportation order gallows for anyone who touches my property. Put me down and shake me up, you brimstone black feet. <coughs> Charlie? Miss, you've come back to us. How long was I away, Charlie? Two whole weeks nearly, Miss. The doctors didn't think you'd pull through it. But I knew you would, Miss. I knew you wouldn't leave us. It's very dark, isn't it, Charlie? The doctors thought the light might hurt your eyes. I think I could bear a little more light now. do fade with time, though you could hardly tell they were there, they say. Bring me a looking glass. I want to see what you see. Not now, miss. Leave it till tomorrow. Leave it till you're strong enough to get out of it. No, Charlie. I mean it.
supposed to be my fortune, and now I'm quite sure of it. Honest. Please don't cry for me. I think I'm very lucky to be alive, thanks to you. I'll run and tell Mr. John Dice. He'll be so happy, Miss. Esther. 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 I don't mind you seeing me as I am. But I'm not sure I want Ada to see me like this. I think it would upset her. Well, you will have to take your chance on it. Because I haven't been able to keep her away. Mr. Guppy, of Kenjin Carboy is on a matter of personal business with her ladyship. Her ladyship is going out directly. Don't you see the carriage at the door? Yes, I do see the carriage. And I want to see my lady too. And I think she will see me. If you'd be so good as to wait there, Mr. Guppy. Circumstances beyond my control. Oh, Lord. Well, Mr. Guppy? I, I, I have to beg your ladyship's pardon for arriving at such an inconvenient time. I told you you could arrive at any time. Sit down, or stay standing, if you please. Your ladyship is very affable. As for sitting down, I hardly know whether it's worth your while to be detained for so long as it would take. The fact is, Your Ladyship, I have not got the letters that I mentioned when I had the honour of waiting upon Your Ladyship. And you have come here merely to say that? It is not impossible, Your Ladyship, that I will be able to obtain them at a future date. There were very unusual circumstances. The person of whom I was to have the letters came to a very sudden end. What sort of sudden end? Fire, milady. And were the letters destroyed with the person? Impossible to say for certain, milady. But I will do my utmost to try and... All right, Mr Guppy. You have said all that you can usefully say at present. Yes, milady. Then I wish you good day. Oh, I beg your pardon, Lady Dedlock. I had some business of Celeste's to attend to, and I supposed that this room would be empty. A thousand pardons, my lady. Excuse me. No, stay. The room is at your disposal. I am going out, and I have nothing more to say to this young man. Good day. Excuse me, Mr. Tulkinghorn. Do we know you, young man? Are you not from Kenge and Carboys? Yes, sir. My name is Guppy. Mr. Guppy of Kenge and Carboys. I understood that I had the honor of conducting her ladyship's legal business. May I ask what brought you here, Mr. Guppy? You may, sir. But I am not at liberty to answer. Indeed. Very good, Mr. Guppy. Beyond saying it was business of a private and confidential nature. Oh, I see. Thank you, Mr. Guppy. I'm much obliged to you. Good day. What has been happening? What have I missed? You have been missed. Very much. One strange thing. 
one day when I walked up to the village, I met Jenny from the Brickfields. She was so sorry to hear you were ill. Blamed herself over it. Did she have any news of that poor boy, Joe? No. But what she did say was very strange. She told me that a lady with a veil had stopped by her cottage and asked after your health. What lady? She couldn't say. Stranger. But this lady had taken a handkerchief of yours as a keepsake and left her some money for it. Do you remember that handkerchief, Esther? Uh, the, the day her baby died. I used it to cover his face. Yes. Jenny had kept it with the baby's things. But the lady with the veil had been so particular about wanting it. What a strange thing. I hope you're not tiring her, Ada. No, indeed. I feel stronger with every day. Then perhaps you'll feel well enough to see someone who's been very anxious to hear about your progress. My physician, Mr Woodcourt, you remember him? Yes, very well. But have you heard what happened? No, what? Oh, my dear, there was a terrible shipwreck. Oh, oh don't be agitated. He's safe. Hundreds of dead and dying, numbers of drownings thrown upon the rocks, but through it all, my physician was a hero. Saved many lives. The whole country rings with it. He should have a title bestowed upon him, and no doubt he will. No one could deserve it better, I'm sure. And he's well. You are sure of it? Quite. Quite well, my dear. Guppy, Claire. What do we know of Guppy? Guppy? Young Mr Guppy, of Kench and Carboys. Yes. Not a lot, Mr Tulkinghorn. Not much is known against him at any event. Keen, respectable young clerk, ambitious is the word they use for Mr Guppy, looking to rise in the world. Hmm. Were you thinking to employ Mr Guppy, sir? In some capacity? No. I sent for Smallweed. Has he come? He's waiting in the outer office, sir. I'm carried in. If you care to come through, Mr. Smallweed, Mr. Tulkinghorn is expecting you. Oh, I have a care, you slaughterhouse ruffians. Oh. oh, my bones and sockets. I tell you, Mr. Tulkinghorn, I'd take it very kindly if you'd wait upon me once in a while instead of causing me to be posted all over London like a box of butcher's tripes. Very kind of you to attend, Mr. Smallweed. I should be at Crooks guarding my property. And what is there to guard, especially? I don't know, and that's a fact. But that old brimstone beast had something worth snaffling. Guppy's after something there, I know that. Guppy, you say? Very puffed up and full of himself he was at the inquest. Was the name of Horton mentioned there? Horton? No. But he's at the heart of it, I believe. I think we should speak to Sergeant George again, Mr. Smallweed. Call in his debt, squeeze him dry, smash him to sawdust. If need be, Mr. Smallweed. It may come to that. It's come to this, has it, Sergeant? You're ready to be ruined for the sake of showing or not showing a piece of paper with some handwriting on it. For myself, sir, it counts very little either way. It counts very little, does it? Let's see you smash the sawdust, see how that counts with you. For yourself, Sergeant. But you have at least one other who depends on you for everything. Would you bring him down with you to serve your own pride? Your friend Captain Horton's dead and gone. But what's poor Phil's squad to do if you lose your establishment? Starve, I suppose. That's nothing to me, oh, Mr. Smallweed. But how will it rest with your conscience, Sergeant? If I show the letter, no harm will come to anyone from it. I offer no guarantees, but if you don't show it, I think you understand the consequences. Then I have no choice. You have the document with you? No, but I will bring it. 
I'll make sure that you do. But take care, Mr. Tulkinghorn. You hold the lives of others very cheap, I think. If I were you, I should be fearful for my own. Do you threaten me, sir? I have been threatened before, and those who made the threat had reason to regret it. I think I have little to fear from such as you. Clem! Show the gentleman out. Have you done, Mr. George? All right, Phil. Is that the captain's letter? It is, Phil. You gonna hand it over to Mr. Tulkinghorn? I can't see my way out of it, Phil. It's that, or we're on the street. Tell him to go hang. We'll get by. I'll be all right, Mr. George. You don't want to worry about me. So I can go back and he'll want to. I think your fighting days are over, Phil. No offence. But this, it's a matter of honour. The captain's honour. Matter of life or death, Phil. And the captain's dead. I think my duty's to the living. Mr. Tulkinghorn will have what he wants. This time. Oh, so kind of you, my dear Mr. Jarndyce. Such hospitality, and now a carriage all to myself. You will be remembered on the Day of Judgment, when my little birds shall all be set free. I'm glad to hear it. Have a safe journey, Miss Blythe. Your cousin, my dear. Mr. Carstone, the other warden Jarndyce. What about him, Miss Blythe? Let someone hold him back, or he'll be drawn to ruin. But Richard is in no danger, Miss Blythe. Oh, I know the signs, my dear. I saw them begin in Gridley, and I saw them end. But just let someone hold him back, and, and all may yet be well. Goodbye, my dears. Goodbye. What's this, Clam? The writing sample from Sergeant George, Mr. Tulkinghorn. I asked him to step inside, but he wouldn't wait. No matter. Let me see it. So this is Captain Horden's hand. And this is the handwriting of the law writer, known as Nemo. I'd say the handwriting of the two documents was identical. Would you, Claire? We shall be quiet now Miss Flight has left us. 
She does love to talk, doesn't she? <laughs> Ada, what is it? I didn't quite like what she said about Richard. Miss Flight says a lot of odd things about all sorts of subjects. To say that he might be ruined. To compare him to poor Mr. Gridley. Richard's love for you is steady. He's not like Mr. Gridley. Or Miss Flight. He is someone besides himself to care about. I will keep him straight. Yes. <laughs> yes, it will, ain't it? I hope it will. We should be going down. You know, you're ready. Yes. <laughs> but that was exciting news about Mr. Woodcourt, wasn't it? Fancy to be in a shipwreck to save all those sailors' lives. You must have felt very proud of him, Esther, when you heard the news. I did feel proud of him. I do. I can't help it, though. He's nothing to me now. Esther, how can you say that? Because it's true. He cared for you. No, he did. Perhaps he did. And perhaps he might have told me before he went away if I had been richer or somebody's daughter. But he never did. And now I'm glad he did not. If he had, how he would regret it when he saw me again as I am now. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Ada. It's the truth and you know it. We are quiet this evening. As Esther said would be. Perhaps we should send for Miss Flight to come back again. Mm -hmm. Oh, forgive me, Ada, Esther. I think the wind's been in the east again. Now. <clears throat> Esther, could you spare me a few minutes of your time in the growlery after dinner? Yes, of course. Shut the door. <laughs> I was walking past your room on my way down to dinner, and I couldn't help overhearing a little of your conversation. Oh. And I must apologize to you for that. You have no need to. Anything I say to Ada, I would say to you. Then I hope you won't mind my saying that. I was sad to hear you talk as you did. About Mr. Woodcourt? Yes. I, I, sit down, Esther. Did you truly care for him? Whether I did or not matters very little now. His mother made it quite clear that I was not to think of someone with his <laughs> distinguished ancestry. And now it is quite beyond doubt. I shouldn't think there's a man in the world who'd want to marry a potmark nobody like me. Yes, sir. Isn't it true? It's... Please, don't think I pity myself. Because I don't. I know that I'm very lucky to be alive. And a bleak house, so long as you're happy to keep me here. More than happy, Esther. And whatever the woodcourts of this world may think or feel, there are those who love you very dearly. And your, your misfortune has not made you any less lovable than you were. Perhaps even dearer to someone who knows you and truly loves you. Thank you. But you didn't need to say that. I knew you would not change. And Ada and Charlie, they feel the same. Not quite the same, Esther. Oh, near uh, enough, I think. Uh, so you mustn't worry about me, sir. I shall do very well with my friends about me.
Rubbish. 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 Hmm. Rubbish. Shake me up, Judy. Ugh. Not so rough, you poor parrot. Let's have the next lot. There's money in this somewhere, I know it. And I'll have it. Because I'm owed it, and it's mine. Out, out, out! Private property, close for business. No admittance to loiterers, hawkers and thieves. No admittance to anybody. Get out. It's all right, my old Mr Smallweed. You know me, I think. Uh, Guppy. Of Kenjin Carboys. Oh, I know you. At the inquest, snooping around. What do you want now? I'm interested in recovering a bundle of letters for a client. Who's the client? I'm not at liberty to disclose, Mr. S. You give nothing, you'll get nothing. Who's the client? A lady. Oh, a lady. Very nice. So what are these letters you're after, then, you young villain? Not a villain, sir. I am a member of the legal profession. Same fig, same fig. <laughs> oh. So what are these letters? They're private letters. Intimate letters of no interest to anyone but my client. But she'll pay for them. Oh, uh, will she? As I say, they're of no value. No value at all, except to my client. But she'll pay for them. And she'll pay a, a nominal sum. You mean you'll pay a nominal sum and she'll pay you a king's ransom, you young blackguard? That's about it, eh? Not at all, Mr Smallweed. My motives are very pure. To help my client and... Also, if I can, to help another lady. A lady who is very dear to my heart, Mr Smallweed. You do like your ladies, don't you, Mr Guppy? So how am I to know these letters, supposing I can lay my hands on them? They are tied up with the pink ribbon, Mr Smallweed. Oh, pink ribbon, very nice. Shake me up, Judy. And... And? And what? Come on, out with it! Addressed to a Captain Horden. Captain Horden, yes. Captain Horden. You know the name, Mr Smallweed? No. Never heard of him. All right, Mr Guppy. We are making an inventory of the deceased's possessions. Very heavy work, as you can see. If we find these letters, we might see our way to entering into negotiations with your lady client. That's all I can say for the present. Show the gentleman out, Judy. Thank you very much, Mr Smallweed. And, uh, very good night to you. Never mind all that. Get out. Get out! And lock the door behind him, Judy. <laughs> Captain Orden. And a lady. And a young lady. There'll be money in that, I believe. So where's these letters, you brimstone beast? A letter from my friend Boythorn with an invitation to visit him. He's most pressing. Should you like to go, Esther? You well enough recovered to stand the journey, do you think? The journey would be nothing, but... Uh... But what? I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable about being seen outside our little circle. I suppose that's very vain of me. You'd wear a veil, Esther, when you go abroad. Isn't Boythorn's a good old friend who cares for you almost as much as we do? Look what he says here. If you refuse to come, he swears he'll tear his house down. <laughs> brick by brick and stone by stone. <laughs> no, you wouldn't be responsible for that, Esther. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I must get used to my new self and people see me as I am now. Please tell Mr. Boythorn I'm delighted to accept his invitation. If you please, my lady. Yes, what is it? I thought you'd like to know the young ladies are staying at Mr. Boythorn's again. They've been seen round the village. Both? Yes, my lady. The one who was ill, Miss Summerson? Is it? Is she recovered? Yes, my lady, thank the Lord. But they say her poor face is terrible scarred from the smallpox. Thank you.
Thank you. Mrs. Randall. This is good of you, boy Thorn. Well, one does what one can. What can a man do to make up for what has happened to that poor girl? Nothing. How did it come upon her? She caught the infection from a poor vagrant boy that we took in. I, I blame myself. I... Blame yourself because of an act of kindness to a fellow human being? That's out of nonsense, man. It's puppycock. I'll tell you who's to blame. It's that fellow up there who calls himself God Almighty. I mean, what kind of deity is it who would visit such an affliction on an innocent girl? I ask you, John Nice. Who's the almighty thing he's up to? He let her live. <laughs> so, are you glad you accepted Mr. Boythorn's invitation? Oh, yes. I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, miss. And a fine one, too. Have you been blackberrying? We have, miss. Would you ladies like to taste some? Thank you. Thank you. Very welcome. Good day to you now. What's the matter with the lady's face, Pa? Don't be rude. You've never heard the story of the ghost walk at Chesney Wold? I'm not sure I believe in any such thing. Well, you better. Because it's a true story. And you may see the ghosts walk for yourself. In the days of Charles I, there was a deadlock called Sir Morbury Deadlock. And he was loyal to the king. But his lady, who had no family blood in her veins, favored the rebels. She spied upon her husband and betrayed him. And no matter what Sir Morbury did, he could not bend her to his will. She would creep down at dead of night and lame the horses. That was the story. So Sir Morbury and his friends couldn't ride out to battle. And one night, he caught her at it. And he threw her to the stone floor so violently that he broke her hip bones. It's not a pretty story. And she died slowly from her injury. But before she died, she cursed her husband. And ever afterwards, she said, whenever you hear my footsteps on that terrace, you may be sure that calamity and disgrace is coming to the house of Deadlock. And so it has been from that day to this. Well, I should like to see it. Then I'll take you there tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> 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 yes, Clam? Sergeant George, Mr. Tulkinghorn. What about him? Well, sir. Seeing as how he provided the handwriting sample. Yes. Well, am I to send him through the paper to say that he's released of the debt? No. You say no, Mr. Talkinghorn? Tell Smallweed to let the matter rest for one month and then foreclose on the debt. I don't... I don't quite understand you, Mr. Talking. I did not expect to have to justify my actions to my clerk, Clam. But, since you ask, I choose to foreclose on the debt because I wish to do it. And because I can do it. Sergeant George is going to have to learn that there is a price to be paid for acts of defiance. Quite clear, Claire? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good. Then go and do as I tell you.
This is as far as I may come. Any further, and Sir Arrogant Numbskull's ruffians would set upon me. I think he's trained his very dogs to smell me out. But you ladies will be safe to roam the grounds as long as I'm not with you. Now, the ghost walk is around to the side. There. I wish you a happy exploration. Thank you, Mr. Voithorn. And if you see the ghost, tell her that Lawrence Boythorn would be very happy to see disgrace and ruin for Sir Arrogant Numbskull and all his tribe. It's a great big dark old place, miss, ain't it? Do you like to live in a place like this, Charlie? No, you fear, miss. No, I. This must be the place. I don't care for it much, miss. We should stay still and quiet. Perhaps we'll hear the ghost's footsteps. Summerson, I'm afraid I have startled you. You have been very ill, I know. Are you unwell now? I was quite well but a moment ago, Lady Dedlock. Miss Summerson, I should like to speak with you in private. Perhaps Miss Clare and your maid could go back ahead of you. I would be very much obliged. Yes, of course, my lady. Come sit down with me, child. will heal. What? What is it? I have something to tell you. Something so dreadful I'm not sure that I have the courage to speak the words. I am your mother, Esther. I don't understand. I am your wretched and unhappy mother. <laughs> Can you bear to look at me? Can you forgive me? You are truly my mother. <laughs> I never knew you lived. They told me you had died only hours after you were born. For 20 years, I never knew I had a daughter living. I thought I should never see you. May I? May I call you Mother May? May I? May I? <laughs> How long have you known? How did you find me? I only discovered the truth very lately. And then I was told that you were ill, even dying, and I was desperate to think that I should never see you to tell me the truth about yourself. And now I am well, and we have all the time in the world. has no happy ending. I was a willful and impetuous young woman. I fell in love with a young officer and I lay with him the night before he went away with his regiment to the West Indies. 
He never returned. He was reported dead. So this was my father? Yes. What was his name? His name was Horden. James Horden. He was a captain in the Light Dragoon. But he never knew of my existence. I was very ill at my confinement. And when I came to myself, they told me you had died. And I thought I should never feel anything again, nor did I, until now. Sir Lester Dedlock asked me to marry him, and I accepted him. Of course, I told him nothing. I deceived him and let him think that I loved him. That was wicked of me, and no doubt I shall pay for it. I have tried to be a good wife to him, but the family honor means everything to him. And if my secret were known, it would destroy him. He must never know. If he does, everything is lost. He is disgraced and I am ruined. Why? You and I must never see each other again. I've only just found you. Don't send me away now. I must. I... If we were to see each other again, it would be discovered for certain and it would all come out. This must be the first and last time, my dear daughter. I came to see the ghosts walk, and I thought it was just a story, but it's true. Isn't it? I am the one who will bring calamity and disgrace to the house. It is true what Miss Barbary said. It would have been better if I had never been born. Um. <laughs>
there anything you want, my lady? No. Thank you, Rosa. Nothing at all. Well enough now, Ada. But you were upset. Didn't deny it. I saw you as you ran into the house. I was a little upset. But now I'm fine. It was Lady Dedlock, wasn't it? What did she say? Was she very angry with us for trespassing? No. What then? I can't tell you, Ada. It's a secret? Yes, it's a, it's a secret. So secret you can't tell your best friend in all the world? Well, I gave my word. Perhaps one day I shall be able to tell you. But for now, you must promise to never ask me about it. I thought we would never have secrets from each other, Esther. I hope that this will be the only one. I was going to tell you one of mine, but now I'm not sure that I shall. <laughs> <laughs> Esther! Ada! Later. Mm -hmm. My dear young ladies, what can I say? What a wretched dog I am, to be sure. Invite you to stay, then abandon you to your fate like the babes in the wood. Yet it must be done. And my friend John now says you will forgive me. Why, Mr. Boythorn, whatever is it? All my friend means is that he's been called away on urgent business and I'm to accompany him to witness a document. I've assured him you'll be able to survive our absence very well. It'll only be for a day or two. Yes, indeed. Being as you are too very sensible, and competent young women? I hope we are, sir. Well, I am most prodigiously obliged to you both. There. What a bit of luck. I couldn't think I was going to manage it. Manage what, Ava? Ladies. Well, you must be cross, Aster. Someone staying here that wants to see you. Wants to see me. We are ladies. changed as you see no no still our same dear Esther <laughs> what a joy it is to be together again all three of us let's sit down so let's say those two young people marry what about Esther Though she has been Ada's companion, will she go with Ada when Ada is Mrs. Carston? I would hope that she would want to stay on at Bleak House. As your housekeeper? Not necessarily as my housekeeper. <laughs> then as what, man? <sighs> of course. Why didn't I think of it before? You mean to marry her. <laughs> you mean to marry her. Is it so very ridiculous, Boythorn? Ridiculous? Oh, of course not. One hears of such things every day. Old men marrying their young housekeepers. <sighs> Tell me, if you don't think I'm being over curious, when did you first conceive this plan? When you first put her to school? No. Was I... that what it was all along? Were you bringing her up to be your bride? No, it, it, uh, Boythorn, I beg of you. No, she knows nothing of this, not yet. Now, no, I've spoken more than I meant to. You'll respect my confidence, old friend. Absolutely. Though I were dragged apart by horses, 
until I was torn in pieces. I wouldn't breathe a word of it. So this was your secret? Did you think it's very bad of us to see each other in secret? No. But you could have come to the house, Richard. You'd have been very welcome. I'm not so sure of that. Things are a little awkward at present between our guardian and me. All my fault, I dare say, but here we all are. I hope you'll both stay for supper. Mr. Grubble is engaged to his best for us. <laughs> Fowl, chops, cutlets, and I don't know what. <laughs> Esther, so good to see you again. I, um, I came as soon as I could. And how does army life suit? Oh, well enough, I suppose. But I find it hard to settle. The thing is, Esther, it's very difficult to settle to anything until our chancery suit is decided. But our, our guardian says the case could run on for years and years without ever seeing a settlement. He says it's the family curse, Richard. What Mr. John Jarndyce says and what might be the case can be two very different things. Besides, I'm not accountable to Mr. Jarndyce or to Mr. Anybody. We won't go into that now. He and I must agree to differ, that's all. So, are you looking after your own legal affairs now? No, no, Voles is the man. And what a man for putting his shoulder to the wheel. But Mr. Skimpole introduced us, you know. I'm eternally grateful to him for doing so. You won't be joining your friend for supper, Mr. Skimpole? Um, not this evening, Mr. Grubble. Best not. Ah, oh, right you are, sir. Um, fresh stars, Mr. Grubble? Right you are, sir. Is Mr. Skimpole the best person to advise on matters of business, do you think? Well, I was surprised myself at first, you know, but if you met Voles, you'd settled out aside. We're all action now. There's more expense, of course, but uh, that's only to be expected if we're to see results. Ada understands all that, don't you, Ada? I mean, it's for your sake as much as mine, you know? But Richard, what if nothing were to come of it after all? What if you've been wearing yourself out with waiting and anxiety and false hopes and expense? I never wanted to be rich, and I'm sure you didn't either. No, of course not. Then why not give it up? Give it up? And then we could be poor and happy. <laughs> Ada, I would. I'd do it like a shot. The, the money's nothing to me. Then. Justice. Justice for me and for Ada. That's all I want. And I won't be done out of my rights by Mr. John Jarndyce or by anybody. But let's leave all that. Seize the moment. I can't tell you how happy I am to be with you both again. And you will spend all day with us tomorrow. You see what I was thinking? If we can keep him here, away from all his cares in London, then he'll remember himself. The old Richard, he never really went away. He certainly loves you as much as he ever did. Do you think so? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think he does. And I shall never give him up, no matter what happens. <laughs> Esther, do you think we could persuade him to stay here until Mr. Jarndyce comes back? And then we could all be friends again? We could try. Now, pay heed. That's for the rag and bow man. Those are for the rag and bow man. Grandfather. And you're for the rag and bow man, you give me back answers. What's that? Give it here. I thought it might be what Kenji's boy was talking about. Pink ribbons. I was under your chair. It's them. The letters to Captain Alden from a lady. <laughs> There's money in this. <laughs> who's there? Who's there? Get out! Get out! Trespassers! Spies! Miss Smallweed. I reside in this house, and I have a perfect right to be here. Only on my say-so. Who's the landlord here? Me! And we're putting the rents up. Get some proper tenants in, eh? Queen's councils, members of parliament, younger sons of the aristocracy. <laughs> younger sons of the aristocracy? Here? I don't think so, Mr. Smallweed. Good day to you. Don't you turn your nose up on me. I'll see you in the gutter! Life 
could be like this all the time. <laughs> well, it could, couldn't it? One day. Perhaps. Ah, Miss Summerson, how delightful. A thousand pardons for this intrusion upon the Sylvan scene. <laughs> And this... Well, can it be... Poor Mr. Covens' eldest daughter? Yes, sir. If you please, sir. It's Charlie, sir. Charlie. And grown so fine. Why, you're a credit to your poor father, my dear. Thank you, sir. You know, I was able to give him a good deal of employment while he lived. And if one of your little brothers should set up in the same profession, I dare say I could do the same for him. Yes, very likely. <laughs> Miss Summerson, always so sharp. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm so... But, only John and I should heeded my advice. The, um, the, the... But not still contagious, I hope. Not in the least, Mr Skimpole. You needn't fear. May I ask who your friend is, Mr Skimpole? Well, you may indeed, Miss Summerson. This is Mr. Voles, Mr. Carstone's indefatigable attorney. Just come down from London on urgent business for his client. Well, and now you understand the reason for our visit. I hope we don't disturb you, Miss Summerson. Mr. Carstone gave express instructions that he was to be informed whenever his case is up before the Chancellor. And as I find it is in the paper for tomorrow, I am come down by the express coach to confer with him. I expect he will want to go straight back to London. Is his presence really necessary tomorrow, sir? Well, now. Can it do any good? No, I'm not aware that it can. Then why all this travelling up and down, which I suppose is at Mr. Carstone's expense? You suppose correctly, Miss Summerson. But Mr. Carstone has laid down the principle of watching his own interests. And when a client lays down his own principle, I'm obliged to carry it out. Am I not? Of course I am. My conscience is quite clear. Ah, I believe I see my client now. Excuse me, Miss Summerson. There you are, Miss Summerson. Common sense, responsibility and respectability all united. What a man he is, to be sure. And what a pleasure to be able to introduce him to our young friend. And how did that come about? Why, Voles asked for the introduction and I... Uh, I gave it. Did any money change hands, Mr Skimpole? Why, now you mention it, yes. I believe it did. Hmm. Indeed. I think you might say that Voles bribed me. <laughs> well, he gave me something at any rate. Called it commission. Was it a five pound note? Do, do you know, I think it must have been. I understand. Ah, Miss Summerson, you understand everything. So young. Whereas I, I understand nothing. Child. Child. Mr. Smallweed, chop shot, no admittance. Get out for a set of dogs on you. Ruff, ruff, ruff. Down, sir, down. Better get out quick, I can't hold them. Mr. Smallweed, it's me. Guppy, Kenji Carboys. Guppy, is it all right? Come forward. Stand to be recognised. Shake me up, Judy. Oh, what do you want? I was wondering whether you'd come across those letters I was mentioning, Mr. Smallweed. Letters? What letters? We're up to our throats in letters here. Tied with pink ribbon in a lady's hand addressed to a Captain Horden. Ah, those letters. Now I recall. So what if I had found them? Now, my client would be very interested in purchasing them. Your lady client? That's right. For a nominal sum? That's right. What sort of sum? Ten pounds. <laughs> Ten pounds? Do you think I'm a newborn baby, Mr Guppy of Kenge and Carboys? If I was to have a sight of them, Mr Smallweed, I may be able to offer something a little bit more handsome. So... Have you got them, or not? Mr Guppy. Oh, Mr Tulkinghorn, sir. 
How do you do, sir? Here on business, Mr. Guppy? I am, sir. Kent and Carboy's business? No, sir. Oh, set up chambers of your own, have you, Mr. Guppy? No, sir. I am here on behalf of a private client. In Kent and Carboy's time. Mr. Kent will be interested to hear of it when I tell him. Really, sir, begging you wouldn't. Name of your private client. Not liberty to disclose it, sir. Quite sure about that. Wild horses wouldn't drag it from me, Mr. Tulkinghorn. Wouldn't they now? All right, Mr. Guppy, take yourself off. But I was talking to Mr. Smallweed. Good day, Mr. Guppy. Right. After them letters. Did you let him see them? No, Mr. Tolkienholm. Or let him know that you had them? No, Mr. Tolkienholm. As soon as I saw the name Horden, I thought, Mr. Tolkienholm will want to see these. Hmm. Quite right. I shall want something for him, Mr. Tolkienholm. I will pay you 250 pounds for these letters, on condition that you deny ever having seen them or any knowledge of Captain Horden in connection with a lady or with anything else. Do you agree? Yes. And that concludes our business. My clerk will bring you the money before close of business today. Good day to you. And then the search fees, and the attendance fees, and the various disbursements, and attending upon your good self. Yes, yes, of course, but we are making progress. We are very active, Mr. Carston. We have our shoulders to the wheel. No stone is left unturned. Yes. Good. Good. If it weren't all so juiced expensive. That is the way of things, Mr. Carston. Nothing is for nothing, as they say. The Lester and Lady Deadlock still in town, Clam? Uh, no, sir. They've returned to Chesney World. Then I shall have to visit them there. You have a gentle touch, Rosa. Thank you, my lady. I find it soothing. And I am in need of soothing. We are all out of sorts today, Rosa. Sir Lester is out of sorts because his candidate has lost the election. Are you interested in politics, Rosa? No, my lady. Nor am I. But it seems he was defeated by Mr. Rouncewell's candidate. Sir Lester is very angry with Mr. Rouncewell. Thinks Mr. Rouncewell is trying to bring down the aristocracy. I don't care tuppence about it. But I am sorry to see Sir Lester so distressed. Is that why you're out of sorts, my lady? That? And the fact that Mr. Tulkinghorn is coming to dinner. You don't care for Mr. Tulkinghorn, my lady? No, I do not. I care for you, though, Rosa. Very much. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. And I find my house in very good order. No robbers, then. <laughs> no ghosts. No hobgoblins. We did have one visitor, Richard. Mr. Carston came to see us. Rick, was Rick here? You're not angry? No, indeed, I'm only sorry that I missed him. I do not think he would have come to the house if he had known you were here. Still on that tack, is he? The wind is in the east there. Oh, Rick, Rick. We tried to persuade him to stay. 
He was called away. Army business? Unfortunately not. Court business? Yes. He has a new lawyer, a Mr. Voles. Introduced to him by Mr. Skimpole. And they are making a meal of him, I have no doubt. Poor Rick. Ada. I believe I've done you wrong and done Rick wrong. No, I don't think that. Even if Richard does. And he doesn't believe you've done him wrong exactly. Only that his interests conflict with yours in the Chancery Court. Ada, my dear, I gave up all my claims to an interest in that case many years ago. When I say, did you wrong, I mean when I refused my consent to your engagement. It would have been better if I had consented. Well, I consent now. Rick's love for you is the best and steadiest thing about him. You are his best hope now, Ada. In the matter of John Dice and John Dice, yes, Mr. Brownlow. Application for costs, my lad. Yes, I dare say. Any more? Uh, Very well, I'll hear them now. As for the rest, the several depositions and representations waiting to be heard, the meat of the matter, as one might say, postponed to Wednesday fortnight. And this man, Rouncewell, who has been a guest in my house, a guest under my roof, Tulkinghorn, has sided against me with the rabble. Most regrettable. And this was the man who wanted to take my lady's maid away and educate her, if you please. As if Chesney World were not good enough for her. No, I have no intention of parting with her. But these people are very proud in their way. If they felt the girl, Rosa, is it? had been tainted by the association. Tainted? Ridiculous. I heard a story very lately of a townsman of Mr. Rounswell's whose daughter attracted the attention of a great lady. Yes, yes, go on. The great lady I speak of treated the girl with great kindness, kept her always near her, and so far so good. But the great lady had a secret. She had, in early life, been engaged to marry a young rake, a captain in the army. She never did marry him, but she gave birth to a child of which he was the father. Shocking, shocking. Years later, the truth emerged. And when Mr. Rounswell's townsman heard of it, he took his daughter away from the great lady saying that she had been tainted by the disgrace of the association. Hmm. Well, in such circumstances, of course, if such thing were possible, one could understand it. But the fact of the matter is that such a set of circumstances could not possibly happen. The behavior you speak of would never have taken place. Well, yes, quite exactly. The story must, I suppose, be apocryphal. Hmm. suspected for a long while. Fully known it a little while. Months? Days. And now you are going to expose me? I have not yet decided what I'm going to do. You can save yourself the trouble. I shall leave Chesney Walt tonight and forever. No, you will not. You will hear what I have to say.
Go on. You must understand, Lady Dedlock, that my sole consideration in this unhappy case is Celesta. Then why do you keep me from going away? Because your flight would spread the whole truth far and wide. It would be impossible to save the family credit for a day. It is not to be thought of. When I speak of Celesta being the sole consideration, he and the family credit are one. Celesta and the baronetcy, Celesta and his ancestors, Celesta and Chesney Wold. So, this is to be hushed up, if it can be. And how can it be if Celesta is driven out of his wits or laid on his deathbed? Go on. My experience teaches me that most people would do far better to leave marriage alone. So I thought when Celesta married, so I have always thought since. Well, what's done is done. I must now ask you to keep your own counsel for the time being about what we both know. And I will keep mine. I am to drag my present life out, holding it pains at your pleasure, day by day. I am afraid so, Lady Dedlock. I am not sure that I could do that, Mr. Tulkinghorn. You must, Lady Dedlock, for your husband's sake. For the sake of the family honor, you must. Your flight would spread the whole truth far and wide. It would be impossible to save the family credit for a day. It is not to be thought of. Rosa, come here, Joan. Yes, my lady? What would you say if, after all, I let Mr. Rouncewell take you away and have you educated to be his son's wife? I thought your ladyship wanted to keep me as long as possible. But circumstances have changed. You do like Mr. Ranswell's son? Yes, my lady. I have been selfish wanting to keep you for myself. I shall be very sorry to lose you, Rosa. Dear Esther, dearest Esther, my very dear girl, uh, no. My very dear Esther, I 
hope. What I write will not come as too much of a surprise to you. I'm sorry, do I disturb you? No, no, not at all. Uh, what is it, Esther? Uh, I should like your permission to make a short visit to London. You remember Caddy Jellaby, who married Mr. Turveydrop from the dancing school? Well, she tells me she's going to have a baby. Oh. <laughs> and Ada would like to come with me. Of course, she wants to see how Richard is getting on. So have we your permission? Yes, yes. <laughs> I had hope by now. <clears throat> well, never mind. Uh, Esther, of course you have my permission. My very best wishes to young Mrs. Turveydrop. Thank you. I'm very sorry, Mr. Talking Horns again. I will see him. I will. Let me pass. I'm very sorry, Mr. Talking Horns. I have had a great deal of trouble to find you, sir. Have you? He's not at home. He's engaged. He's this and that. He's not for you. Well, you're here now. What have you to say? That you have not used me well. You have been mean and shabby. I helped you to trap my mistress. The dress the boy recognized. You owe me something, Mr. Talkinghorn. My dear young woman, I owe you nothing. You performed a service and you were paid for it. You promised to help me. You said you would find me a good position. I said I would consider it. Having considered it, I decided against it. Because I judge your temperament to be too fiery to be suitable for a lady's maid. With a lady who was kind to me, I could be as meek as a queen dove. Hm. I think not. Then you will do nothing for me? Nothing at all. Then you had better beware. No, you had better beware. If you come near these premises again, you may find yourself taken by the police, strapped down on a board and carried through the streets for all to see. What do you think of that? I dare you to do it. Don't put me to the test, young woman. Rent! Uh, in due course, Mr. Smallweed has promised. Now, or you're out! <laughs> now we'll have some fun, Judy. <laughs> you. Rubbish! 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 <laughs> Mr. Smallweed, I, I, I cannot make my key turn in the door. Oh, dear. And why is that, I wonder? Because I had the lock changed, that's why. <laughs> Mr. Smallweed, you, you cannot do this to me. Done it, all right, done it. <laughs> but my, my things. My, oh, my poor little birds. What, what have you done with them? Outside in the alley. You're lucky I didn't wring their little necks. You're lucky I didn't bite their little heads off. Well, go on in. Hook, sling it. No comebacky. Mr. Smallweed, I... where am I to go? <laughs> what do I care about that? Who do you think I am, the Christmas spirit? Go on, hop it, out. One, two, one, two. Judy, take the broom, chase her out. Right you are, Grandad. <laughs> <laughs> there she goes. <laughs> oh, oh, my bones. Shake me up, Judy. As you see, we're managing very well. We've got more pupils than ever before, and Prince has taken on three apprentices, and I've learned myself to play the piano well enough to get by. But how will you manage when the baby comes? Don't know, but we will manage somehow. I'm sure you will, Caddy. And it was you who got me started on trying to make something out of myself. I'm ashamed to think of what I was like when you first met me, all unpolite and inky and not a good word to say to anybody. Mm. <laughs> Maybe you don't see much of a difference now. But if there is, it's thanks to you, Esther. No. No, you've done it yourself, Caddy. I wish I could say I'd done as much with my life as you have with yours. Oh! Oh, oh Lord! 
Mrs Guppy? Is Mr Guppy at home? <laughs> Mrs Guppy, may I come in? <laughs> This is indeed an honour. <laughs> Mother. I, th I took the liberty of sending you a note, Mr Guppy. You did. And I have it here. Mother, please. <laughs> I, uh, I do beg your pardon, Miss Summerson. Perhaps I could speak to you alone for a moment. Mother? I came here rather than to the office because I did not want to cause you any embarrassment remembering what you said to me on another occasion. Oh, yes. Uh, forgive me. Was you referring to the occasion when I um, made a declaration? Lord, um, I feel a little giddy. It's very hot and close in here. Where was I? You were saying that you made a declaration, Mr Guppy, a declaration of love and a proposal of marriage. Which you turned down. You did. You won't object to admit that. I don't object in the least. You proposed and I turned you down. There's no doubt about that. Thank you, miss. I, uh, regret that my arrangements in life, combined with circumstances beyond my control, will make it impossible for me ever to renew that offer in any shape or form. That's quite all right, Mr Guppy. I'm very sorry. Truly, I am. But it couldn't be. Now, could it? You know? But the memory of it will stay with Mr. me. Mr Guppy, please stop. I want to tell you why I came to see you. Beg your pardon. Please do. When you asked me to marry you... Which proposal has now been repudiated on both sides? You also said that you might be able to help me. By making inquiries into my birth and my ancestry? Yes. Yes. And I have already made some discoveries. I want you to stop, Mr Guppy. I have been told all the circumstances of my birth. So I would be very grateful if you would make no further inquiries. Is that all? Yes, Mr Guppy, that's all. <laughs> then, Miss Summerson, Upon my soul, you may rely upon me in every respect. Esther. Ada, what's the matter? I thought you were with Richard. I went to his lodgings at the time we arranged, but they said he'd gone out. I didn't know where. Where else for the court? Another adjournment again. Nothing done. Nothing. Nothing done. No, no, sir. Don't say nothing done, sir. That is scarcely fair. We have our shoulders to the wheel, and the wheel is going round. The wheel goes round. Uh, but it does need oiling from time to time. Yes, indeed. Uh, which reminds me, there are some bills for you to sign, Mr. Castle. Let's go this way. It's just a short step to my chambers. Hey, Esther. Whatever are you doing here? Oh, Lord, it was today, wasn't it? I'm so sorry. Doesn't matter. I found you now. Am I forgiven? Excellent. Now, I know a very good place to eat. The devil's on horseback, the best in London. Do you know, I heard the most extraordinary thing from Tulkinghorn. What was that? Our neighbour Boythorn has been entertaining Mr. John Jarndyce and the wards in Jarndyce. And what should that be to us? Well, Mr. Jarndyce is an old friend of yours, I understand. They should have been entertained here, not at that fellow Boythorn's place. I'm sure that Mr. Jarndyce wouldn't have felt slighted in the least by not being invited here. Well, I disagree. I've written to Mr. Jarndyce to invite them all. Welcome back. 
been a bleak house indeed without you to brighten it. Indeed, I think the wind has been in the east ever since you went away. We went away for long. I know, but you are very much missed. Uh, the pair of you. Now, when you're both ready, supper is on the table. <laughs> mm. We've received an invitation from a very august personage. Celeste Tatlock has invited all three of us to stay at Chesney World. Now, what do you think of that? Why should he invite us? He knows we're friendly with Mr. Boythorn, and he hates Mr. Boythorn. I know, I was astonished myself. But, you know, there's a degree of uh, acquaintance from the past. Um, didn't you meet Lady Dadlock Esther when you went to look at the ghost walk? I think you must have made a great impression on her, and that the invitation really comes from her, rather than Celeste. I'm quite sure it does not. You are not intending to accept, are you? Why not? I couldn't possibly go. Esther, why have an order? If Celeste thinks you're good enough for Chesney World, who are you to disagree? I can't go. Esther. Esther. I've come to tell you why we... Why I, at any rate, cannot go to Chesney World. It is a secret, but I think I must tell you. Go on. I am Lady Dedlock's daughter. She told me so herself, and she also told me that we must never meet again. So you see, the invitation... He couldn't possibly have come from her. Esther, Esther, my poor dear girl. You must not tell anyone else. Of course I shan't tell anyone else. Well, what a burden it must have been to keep that secret. It was for her. Yes. There's a secret I have kept from you all these years. But now I think you should know. The lady who brought you up, who entrusted you to my care, was Lady Dedlock's sister. My sister? But didn't you ever suspect? Not for a moment. I did think you might have been her child, the sister's. That would have explained why she broke off with Boythorn so suddenly. So she sacrificed her life for me. I wish she had not. She never loved me. She was right. It would have been better if I had never been born. But then I would never have known you. Would I? You have filled my life with joy. But you have changed my life, too. Oh, Esther, let me go on now, or I shall never manage it. Uh, our lives are changing. Rick has already left Bleak House, and Ada will not be with us much longer. But I hope that you will want to stay here with me. Yes, of course, if you wish it. Will you stay here as the mistress of Bleak House? As my wife? I, I know the world will say I'm far too old to offer myself as a husband for a young girl, but, I, but I, I, I can't help what I feel. And I care for your feelings much more than the world's. There. <laughs> I've said it. Love you, Esther. Will you be my wife? May I think about it for a little while? Of course. Of course. 
Plongemann. Thank you. You tell your policeman to seize me on the street and bring me here when I have done no crime. What justice is this? You've been annoying respectable citizens, mademoiselle. It seems a friendly warning might be in order. Who gives you your orders? Is it my lady? Or is it that devil talking horn? They are both as bad as each other. Is this a free country? Where is liberty, égalité, fraternité? You forget, mademoiselle. We haven't had no revolution here. I must ask you to write down your present address on this paper. So we can keep an eye on you. <clears throat> Unless you prefer to be clapped in irons. Too sweet. All the same to me. You are as bad as the worst of them. Give me the pen. There. Much obliged, mademoiselle. And that is all? I can go now? I'm ill quiet this morning. This is delicious, Esther. No one makes blackberry jelly like yours. No, indeed. <clears throat> is something the matter? No, nothing's the matter. That is... Esther, we... could you come and see me in the growlery in a little while? Yes, of course. What is it? What's she done? Has she got the accounts all wrong? No, nothing like that, Ada. Hm. I hate secrets. So do I. Why didn't you tell her? You tell her what, exactly? That we are engaged to be married. I, I, I wasn't sure I... Uh... Oh, Esther, I have an anxious night of it. Uh, uh, are you sure this is what you really want? Yes. I would not have said so. You wouldn't have rather have carried on as we were? I was surprised when you asked me to marry you. You thought of me as a... a father, rather than as a lover. Yes. But now I think I could learn to think about you in that other way. Truly? Yes. Truly. I don't know what marriage is like. I think perhaps no one does until they try it. And I think that you and I may do as well as others at it. Dear Esther. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all the same, I think you need time to accustom yourself to the idea. And so for now, I think it's best if we continue as we were. At least that is as far as others are concerned. Not tell Ada. Uh, not for the present. If you should change your mind, you see. I shan't go back on uh, my uh, word. Uh, humor me in this, Esther. Very well. And now I have my work to do. What an inspiring sight. Captain Carsten. 
And where is it to be now? Hmm? China? The West Indies? The Hindu Kush. And we should be caught at a deal for the time being. Well, not too dangerous then. <laughs> not dangerous at all. Except to the pocket. <laughs> I, I've been wondering whether it might be best to sell out after all. Dear me, I am sorry to hear that, Mr. Carston. Well, there are so many expenses. Mess bills, stabling. And one, one or two debts of honour. Ah, yes. Regarding which, if you would be so good as to... Thank you. If I could only have some assurance of a speedy settlement. Ah, uh, Mr. Carston. You know me, I think. I am not the man to give assurances when the facts are not certain. Ah. What a man, eh? What a fellow. What integrity. Yes. Yes, you're a good man, Mr. Bowles. A true friend. Should I sell out, do you think? You might think that the best course. You might very well think that, but I would not wish to influence you one way or the other. I'm afraid that he has no present means at all. Even if he sells out, that money will be eaten up in debts he has incurred in the service. Meanwhile, I have three daughters to support and an aged father in the Vale of Taunton. <laughs> to be fed. Now you mention it, I've always found an application to Mr. John Jarndyce rarely goes amiss. But Mr. Carston has broken with him, has he not? Perhaps he has. But I fancy my friend Jarndyce has not broken with him. Oh, what care I for her son and what care I for treasure and all? What care I for my newly wedded lord? I'm away with the rackle tackle gypsies, oh. Mm. Very pretty. Sir, you startled me. You like your work here, Rosa? Yes, sir. My lady is kind to you? Very kind, sir. She is fond of you. I think. Rosa. My lady. Rosa, will you fetch my book? I think it is in the little sitting room. Yes, my lady. What were you saying to her? Nothing. Merely passing the time of day. I don't like your speaking to her. She is a very agreeable young woman. And I believe she loves you dearly. I wonder what she would think of you if she heard of your disgrace. You will have to forego that pleasure, Mr. Tolkinghorn, as I have decided to send her away. No, you will not do that. Do you presume to tell me how to run my household? We have an agreement, you and I. You will not draw attention to yourself by doing anything out of the ordinary. I understand very well that you wish to protect your little favourite from the taint of association with you, but it will not do, Lady Dedlock. If any action is to be taken, I will decide what and when. Not you. Shake me up. 
Afternoon, Mr. Smallweed. What brings you here? Just a friendly call, George. How's business? Quiet. That's a pity. I've come to call in your debt, George. What are you talking about? That debt was settled, and you know oh, it. Oh, no, George, I don't think it was. Settled? No, 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 no. Look here. £243.7 and tuppence three farthings still owing. Your memory must be playing tricks on you, my old friend. You promised me if I supplied a letter with a captain's writing on it, it would put me straight and clear. And I did it, against my conscience. And now you tell me I'm not straight and clear after all. That's about the size of it. Cruel world, isn't it? What? You little bloodsucker. I'll give you cruel world. I'll snap your neck for you. That debt was settled, and you know no, it. No, George, it's not me, it's him. I'm just the messenger. He sent me to tell you. Who sent you? Oh, my bones, for pity's sake, George. Mr. Tolkien, all. 